you know, functions that are on a flat sheet of paper, just a curve. We're going to do it with these, these weird surfaces, right? And we're going to have something equivalent to this test, right? So when I present it to you, I want you to know that it's kind of like this is, this is kind of where the inspiration comes from, is this test. All right. So we got to get through some definitions and some pictures here. <clears throat> Are there any questions right now? Yeah, we're really going to be able to do something that seems like it might be hard. So here's a surface, right? This is a surface. This is a this is a surface this is a function of two variables. So in this section, what we're doing is we're assuming we can solve the equation for z. z equals some function of x and y. All right? So we're not talking about ellipsoids or spheres or anything like that here. We're just talking about surfaces. So this surface, it's clear, yes, that it has a bunch of like hilltops and valleys. And it would be nice if we could figure out where those were, right? What's the, what are the local maximums and local minimums? That's just another picture of the same thing, zoomed in, right? That's the picture from the textbook, the ebook. And I put that here because it has definitions, like labeled. So this right here would be called the absolute maximum of the function if it's the highest point on the entire function, right? But if you have a hilltop that's next to it that's not as high, that would be called a local maximum. And then the same idea with the minimums, absolute minimum, local minimums. You can read through this. I mean, I think it's pretty, pretty intuitive. Would you agree? Do, now, there is one thing we need to make sure we understand. That's a local max. This is also a local max. They're both local maximums. But there's only one absolute max in that picture. And that's the tallest one, right? And same with this. These are both local minimums, but this is the absolute minimum. Yes. <coughs> is the graph of the function sufficient justification of something being the absolute maximum or minimum? Uh, it kind of depends. I mean, it's just like if I draw you a picture of a graph and I say that, right, like that, can you tell me that's the highest point without seeing the rest of the picture? Not, not really, right? So, you know, if you knew it just did this and like asymptotically did that and that, yeah. then, you, then you could. But so we're limited. We just look at one region, where that's not enough. That's why we have the test, because what we can do is we can look for everywhere we have highest and lowest and then compare. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so we have first a theorem right here. The theorem says if your surface, if it has a local maximum or minimum, okay, if it does, then, and, sorry, I should say and, not. It has to be. So if you have a local max or min, and the first, uh, first order partial derivatives exist, okay, so let's say you have this surface and it has a hilltop. This is three dimensional. It has a hilltop up there, right, the highest point. If it does, and the partial derivatives, you can actually like compute them, then here's what we know. The partials both have to be equal to zero at that point. Okay, so if you have a local max and the partials can be taken, then the derivatives, those uh, partials have to both be equal to zero. All right, that's a theorem. And then from that theorem, we have the second derivative test. So this is going to be way different than, it's going to look a lot different than the one we just did because there's a lot more computations we have to do. So it's, this is the big thing for today. This is the big note right here. This is it. It says, suppose the second partial derivatives of a function are continuous on a disk with a center AB. Okay, this is just saying, make, let's make sure we're assuming that you have some function that you can get the, not only the first partials, but the second partials, the second derivatives. Suppose that's all okay. And also suppose that the partial of f with respect to x is 0, and the partial of, of, of f with respect to y is also 0 at some point, right? Then we are going to define this right here. I'm going to write on the board over here because we're going to need it. 
we are going to define this thing called capital D. And what capital D is, the other notation is capital D at AB. What it is, is you're going to take the, the second partial of f with respect to x. So you're going to take the partial of f with respect to x twice, and then evaluate it at that point, then multiply it times the second partial with respect to y twice, at that point, a, um, sorry, that's not a comma, yeah, it's a comma b, sorry. It is a comma b. And then you're going to subtract from that f partial with respect to x, then y, at that point, a, b. And you're going to take that answer, and you're going to square it. You're going to compute this, capital D, and then there are going to be three different possible outcomes when you compute that. This is just going to be a number, OK? When you're done with this computation, you're just going to have a number. And you're going to look at that number, and you're going to ask yourself, is that number bigger than 0? So if the number is bigger than 0, then what that means is you do not have a local max or min. You actually have what, oh, sorry, hold on. I, I said that completely wrong. I meant to say that this one, sorry. The order that they do here is a little different than I do in the book, or that I do in my notes. So if <coughs> this d is less than 0, negative number, then you do not have a max or min, all right? It's referred to as a saddle point. Now, so if it's negative, you have no max min, right? If it's positive, then you, you either have a max or a min. And the only way to tell is you have to then go and look at that second partial with respect to x, which appears right here in the formula. You're going to look at this. And if that's positive, you have a local minimum. And if it's negative, you have a local maximum. All right? So let me recap, because we're about to do some examples. <coughs> What we're going to do is I'm going to give you a function. I'm going to say, hey, go find me any local maximums or minimums, right? So first thing you do is you're going to take the partials with respect to x and y separately. You're going to set those equal to 0 and try and figure out at what values of, of x and y do you actually satisfy these two equations. So you have to do that first. You have to do this and this. Solve those two equations. Once you solve that, you're going to have a set of points. You take those points and you evaluate capital D at each of the points you get. So at each point, you're going to have a different value of D, different value of D, different value of D. And then from that computation, you're either going to find max or mins. I saw a hand. Yes? Yes, and well, yes. And um, this section deals with it. Um, this section, the way this section deals with it is, remember in Cal 1, if we, if we start a function at a point and end it at a point, then there has to be an absolute max and it has to be an absolute min, right? If I cut it like here to here, there's got to be a highest and lowest point, as long as it's, you know, continuous and we're going to do that in this section. We're going to, instead of letting our domain be everything, we're going to restrict it. And then Lagrange tries to deal with everything, like the, finding the absolute max and min. So Lagrange is, yeah. Lagrange is awesome. It's just, like I said, it, it's a little, little eye-opening for students because, like, you're just going to have to wait. You just have to wait. All right. So here we go. You ready? Do I need to run through the steps again? OK. Here we go. First example. I, I don't want to give away the surface yet. So let's just do that. Um, is that big enough? Can everyone see that? All right, so here's what I'm going to do first. And you, you get to choose how you do this, all right? For this example, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to take all my partials, just to start the problem. I'm going to find the partial with respect to x, then y, then I'm going to do x twice, y twice, and then x, y. So I'm going to find every single partial that I need for this entire thing. You don't have to do it in this order, but I'm going to do it that way. So first, what is the partial of this with respect to x? Negative 2x, right? Right, that's partial with respect to x. And then I need the partial with respect to y. Partial with respect to y is 2y. Now look, today you're going to find out like, how comfortable you are with partials because I'm going to be cranking them out pretty fast. 
right? That, those are our first partials, right? I need those for the first part of the problem. And then over here, I'm going to do the second partials. So partial with respect to x twice would be negative 2, wouldn't it? And then the partial with respect to y twice would be positive 2, right? And then the partial with respect to x, then y, would mean take the partial of this with respect to y, which is 0. Huh. I'm noticing something right away. All of these things that I got over here don't have variables in them, right? So it really doesn't even matter <clears throat> what happens over here. The value of d is going to be the same no matter what point I'm ever at. Do you all understand that? But I'm going to still follow the procedure, OK? I'm going to still follow the procedure here. So I've got my partials. I'm getting ready to actually start doing things now. All right, first thing I'm going to do after the partials is I'm going to figure out you know, when is the partial of f of x with respect, ah, partial of f with respect to x, when is it 0, right? I'm going to figure out that. And then I'm also going to figure out when is the partial of f with respect to y equal to 0. Right? I'm going to try and figure out those two things. Well, that should be pretty straightforward, yes? Take this one right here. When is that 0? So when is negative 2x equal 0? Divide both sides by negative 2. x is 0. There's only one place, right? There's only one value of x that satisfies that equation. <coughs> Similarly, when is the partial with respect to y 0? Well, that's only when y is 0, right? <clears throat> so in order for me to, to be talking about a, trying to find a local max, local min, I need to figure out where these two are true, at what points they're true. And so I'm trying to figure out any points that I can come up with, an x and a y that satisfy both of these simultaneously. So to make this true, there's only one value of x I can use, right? 0. And to make that true, there's only one value of y I can use, and that's 0. And so this is my only critical point. <clears throat> I'll do a quick check. Is this point in the original domain of the function? Like, can you plug 0, 0 into the original function? Yeah, right? So there, I don't have any domain issues. That is a critical point. And so what I want to do now is take that critical point and evaluate capital D at this point. So now that part. <clears throat> so capital D evaluated at 0, 0 will be the second partial with respect to x at the point 0, 0 times the second partial with respect to y at 0, 0 minus the partial with respect to x then y at the point 0, 0 and then all of that squared. But like I said when we first started this, these don't have variables in them, right? So it doesn't matter what I plug in. This is always going to spit out what? This is what? <coughs> Negative 2 times this is always 2. And then minus this is 0 squared. And that comes out to be negative 4, doesn't it? And if you get a negative number, then that means you do not have a local max or min, do you? What you have is a saddle point. So what I should expect is that if I plug in 0 for x, 0 for y, what would come out of the function? 0 as well, right? At this point, at that point on my surface, I should expect to see a saddle. Yes? What is the saddle? Yeah, so what is it? Let's look at the picture of it. Here's the surface. You, you kind of have a visual idea, right, in your mind of what a saddle looks like on a horse. This is basically what it is. What you have is, is kind of like in one direction, in one direction, like let's say um, we have parabolas. Let me, let me look at it from the side. If you look at it from this direction, it looks like parabolas going up, right? You see that? But if you come in from the other side, it looks like parabolas going down. 
And so you get this, you know, and wonder, this like your legs go over this way, but the saddle comes up, right? Same thing. So there is no local maxim in here. <clears throat> Got it? This is the first problem. Very easy partials, nothing crazy, right? We're just going to start getting harder and harder functions to differentiate. But the, the, the principle is the same in all of these. Our answer to the last problem would have been no local maximums, no local minimums, saddle point at zero, zero, zero. Here, find the local max, min values, and the saddle points. All right, let's start cranking out these partials. Y'all sure that's big enough? Y'all can see that? Yes? Okay. Partial with respect to x is, all right, volunteer. You get to go one time and one time and that's it and then you have to wait till we rotate. Go ahead. Uh, 4x cubed minus, four x cubed four. minus what? 4y. Four four y. Anybody disagree? Okay, looks good to me. Who wants the next partial with respect to y? Go ahead. It's going to be 4y cubed uh, minus 4x. Anybody disagree? Okay. Who wants partial with your, I'm going to do the partial with respect to x twice here. So who wants that? Go ahead. 12x squared. 12x squared. Everyone okay? Go ahead. Do you want the next one or do you have a question? Next one? Go ahead. Partial with respect to y twice? 12y. 12y squared, right? Okay. Partial with respect to x, then y. Who wants that one? Go ahead. Pardon me? Negative, Negative four. Thank you. I haven't heard from you. I'm happy to see that. All right. Good. No one has questions on these partials? All right. Now I'm going to go through the task of trying to set both of these equal to zero and figure out what values of x and y make both of those equations true simultaneously. So first let me start with the partial of f with respect to x equals 0. Let me see. I take 4x cubed minus 4y equals 0. Let me go ahead and write the other equation next to this. With the partial of f with respect to y equals 0, that's just 4y cubed minus 4x equals 0. All right. <clears throat> we have options at this point, how we go about this. So one technique would be, I could take this, let me see. How about we take that equation, how about I divide everything by four? Is that okay? You could also say factor of four out and divide by four. But we can eliminate the four completely. This would just become x cubed minus y equals zero, right? And then if I add y to both sides, I get a relationship between x and y, right? So in order for this equation to be true, I need that y be equal to x cubed. That's what would make this true, right? That doesn't help me actually figure out what x and y is, but that's the relationship between the two. Now over here I can do the same thing. Divide both sides by 4. You get y cubed must equal, sorry, y cubed minus x <coughs> must equal 0. And then you have this relationship that y cubed must equal x. Right? Those are almost the same equations. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to say, all right, I, mean, I have some choices here. Um, since both of these have to be solved simultaneously, I can actually take this, x right here is y cubed, and I can replace that in this equation. So it's, a, it's like a substitution that you do when you're doing like uh, li linear equations, same idea. Um, but these are nonlinear equations. You can look at this as right now what we have is a system of equations. We have two equations and we have two unknowns, but they're nonlinear. So all that linear algebra stuff, Gaussian elimination, all that, you throw it out the window because you can't use it if it's nonlinear. So this is just going to be algebra. You can grind it out. So I'm gonna, right now I'm going to go over here and I'm going to replace that x with y cubed. Okay, so I don't know. I'll, I'll use an arrow here. Just So replacing that in there. I'm going to get um, y cubed cubed, right? 
equals y. y cubed cubed equals y. And y cubed cubed is y to the ninth power. I should technically have said like this is actually going in there, right? We're replacing that x. All right, now a dangerous part here. This is a dangerous part. Don't write this down. If I'm continuing from here and I write this, what did I do? I divided by y, okay. Now, what is the only number or numbers that you can raise to the eighth power to get one? One and negative one. So you all agree that right from this you get y equals plus or minus one. You could also say I'm going to take the eighth root on both sides. And any time you take an even root on both sides, you have to do plus or minus. So you get two answers. Yes? What's wrong with what I just did? Go ahead. Y could be zero, right? I lost that solution somehow. I lost it because I divided both sides by y, didn't I? And when you divide by, by a variable, that means you're making a promise that that variable will never be zero. So the, the rule of thumb is don't ever divide by a variable if you can avoid it. So the proper way to do this would be to take this equation and to get all my y's on one side of the equation, okay, get everything moved to the one side, and then factor. If you factor, you can pull a y out like that. And then you can set each factor equal to zero. So if I set, I'm continuing here, if I set the first factor to zero, so I'm setting that equal to zero, I get that equation, then the other one is y to the eighth minus one equals zero, which means y to the eighth equals one. We already got the two solutions here, right? So you got here plus or minus one. And then over here, see, you get this actual solution. See, by doing it this way and not dividing by y, you pick up all the solutions. So just be careful with that, all right? All right, we're not done. Yes? I was going to ask if this Yeah, what this has done is it has given me conditions to make those equations equal to one another, right? But I don't necessarily want them equal to one another. I want them equal to zero, don't I? So let me continue with this. I, I'm just running out of room here. So I'm going to continue here. So let's say, let's take these answers one at a time. If y is zero, what do we get? Go back, go back to, the, um, to these two right here. If y is zero, what's x? Zero. zero. What about over here if y is zero? Zero. zero. So if y is 0, that forces x to be 0, doesn't it? Forces it to be 0, which means that we have one critical number. x is 0, y is 0. That is our first critical number. We will have to take that, and we will have to calculate capital D at that point. But that's not the only one we have. If y is, let's go with positive 1. So if y is positive 1, go back into these. Let me go here. If y is positive 1, then what's x? Well, 1 cubed is 1, and that means x is 1, right? And it satisfies this as well. If y is 1, x cubed equals 1, there's only one answer there, 1 itself. So if y is 1, x is 1. So that's my second <coughs> critical number, x, y. Critical, so I said critical number, I'm sorry, critical point. And then we need one more, right? If y is negative 1. And I think I'm going to get rid of this because I don't need that anymore. If, uh, if y is negative 1, then that forces. You can see it in both of these cases, right? If y is negative 1, you cube it, you still have negative 1. So that forces x to be negative 1. So negative 1, negative 1. There you go. I have three critical points. I have to calculate capital D at all three of these, okay? So let's do first, I'll do the zero, zero, 001 because that's the first one we found. Capital D at zero, 00 equals, 
All right, so what I need to do is take the second partial, plug in 0, 0. The second partial with respect to y twice at 0, 0. Minus the partial with respect to x, then y at 0, 0. Take all of that and square that. I'm going to stop writing this, and I'm just going to start plugging in mentally in a minute. But this is just, again, to show you I'm just using the formula, right, at the point 0, 0. So when I say partial with respect to x twice at 0, 0, that means I go over here to this one, and I plug in 0 for x and 0 for y. But all this has is an x, right? So the answer when I plug 0 into this is just 0. So that's 0. OK, and then times over here, I take the partial respect to y twice, right there. Plug in 0 for x and 0 for y, but this only has y's in it. So this just again goes to 0. And then minus, let's see, partial with respect to x then y was negative 4. There's no x's and y's over here, right? So, so that point 0, 0 has no impact on this answer. So I just get negative 4. And then don't forget to square it. You have to square it there. And so what is that as an answer here? Negative 16. 16. Negative 16. All right. What happens when capital D is negative? It's a saddle point. OK? Saddle point. So I'm going to say I have a saddle. Saddle point at, OK, I need it to write it as the point that actually lives on the surface. So I know the x coordinate is 0 and the y coordinate is 0. I know that because that's the one I was testing, right, 0, 0. But what's the z coordinate when you plug 0, 0 into the original function? Just 1, right? It kills off everything with x's and y's, and I just get 1 is the output. So when I, when I graph this surface, I should expect to see a saddle point at the point 0, 0, 1. All right, two more to go. Right, two more to test here. Capital D at 1, 1. So I'm doing this one now. So let's see. Do I have to write it all out again, or I, I don't mind? Is it all right if I just plug in? Yeah. That okay with everyone? Yeah. Okay, so I'm plugging in x is 1 and y is 1. What happens when I plug 1 in here? Just get 12. And then here, when I plug in 1 for y, I get 12 again. And then minus, this part doesn't change, does it? This is still negative 4, but then squared. This is 144 minus negative 4 squared is 16, but you're subtracting it, so minus 16. And you know what? I don't really care what that number is. It's positive, right? And if it's positive, that means I either have a local max or a local min. It's one or the other. And to determine what it is, what I do is I go back and I look at that first piece right here. The sign of this dictates everything. So this right here, right, is a positive as well. And the way I remember it is the same way I remember um, in Cal 1, concavity, concave up looks like this, right? Concave down looks like this. Concave up, happy people smile, right? People are happy to smile. Positive people smile. Negative people frown. So that's the way I remember. If this is positive, then I should expect concave up, smile. And that means we're looking at a minimum. All right? So this right here will be, what do I say here? I have a local min at, OK, you've got to actually find the order triple. 1, 1. And then what happens if you plug 1? into the original function. I think you get negative 1. Negative 1. You got the idea? And then we do the last one, right? So if I do at D11, D11, d at the point 1, 1 is going to be, well, this doesn't change, does it? I mean, Because that's x squared, so I'm going to square 1. I get 12 there again. I get 12 here again. 
and I still get negative 4 squared. So aren't I going to get a positive number still? I mean, that's the exact same computation. Yes? We did do the positive one. I said negative. I wrote positive. Thank you for pointing that out. I wanted to do negative 1, negative 1. It doesn't matter here, though, right? That's why I kept on going so fast, right? It doesn't matter here, because when we square the x and y, they're going to become positive ones. All right, so now I defer back to, because this is positive, I know I have a local max or a local min. I defer back to this. This is positive as well, which means I have a local min again, right? A local min. It's not the same x and y. No, oh, oh, right, right, right. Right? Now, is it the same z value? Possibly, I haven't done it, actually. What happens when you plug negative 1 in here? You get the same thing, negative 1? Or is it positive 1? What is it? Negative 1. OK. All right. So I'm going to graph this. We're going to look at it visually. What we should see is that at 0, 0, we should see it. Wait, was it 0, 0? At x, x and y is 0, 0, we see a saddle. And then at 1, 1 and negative 1, negative 1, we should see two local minimums. It's hard to see the saddle in here. It's hard to see that saddle, but it's there. Now, of course, this continues. Like, it's, I'm just graphing part of this surface. It continues, all right? All right. I think you're catching on. We got to keep moving because the algebra starts to get messier and messier and messier. Um, and I want to try and show you as, as many examples as possible. I mean, I could say at this point, like, hey, you get the idea. Let's move on. But I think it's important for you to see the types of algebra that's going to be required. It's not that it's crazy algebra. It's just, it's just that, I don't know, maybe you didn't realize you would have to do this much, you know? So I don't want you to be intimidated by like feeling like you're going off like the wrong way because the algebra is getting messy. I don't want you to feel that way. If it gets messy, you're probably doing the right thing. All right, there we go. All right. Who wants the first partial with respect to x? Go ahead. 2x, y. 2, oh, careful. What? What? Respect to x, yes. Yeah, so wouldn't that be 2x, y in the beginning because y comes along for the ride? Y comes for the ride. What's the derivative of that? Yeah, so, oh, 3x. 3x squared y, right? OK, good. Now you're warmed up. Now you're warmed up. You want to keep going? Plus 24x. There you go, plus 24x. OK, we good? Anyone disagree? <laughs> All right, partial of f with respect to y. Go ahead. x cubed minus 